hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor York Baden. Hello, Professor Baden. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. All right. So today, guys, I am interviewing a distinguished academic, and for years I've been consuming his work, and today I get to pick his brain. So, Professor Baden, you are interested in elite numeracy. Why are numerical skills important and why are elites important? Well, I mean, numerical skills are important everywhere, um, no matter whether you do something very sophisticated in your career, um, like building a machine or writing an article, or whether you are doing some more simple tasks like in agriculture, it makes a big difference whether a farmer, for example, can calculate, um, does it make sense to move this stick of wood from there to there, or better go home and fetch something to bring the wood from place A to place B. So uh, in general, numeracy is a very important component of overall education and skills. And elite numeracy is also crucial because we often observe in the historical period that especially the elites were um, among the ener energetic merchants who were building up um, trade uh, relations and the, also creating institutions that <laughs> development. Uh, so it makes a big difference whether they are good with um, numerical proportions or not. Okay, you repeat what you just said. You said that elites created institutions that were what? Sorry? You said that elites created institutions and then from it you yes. broke up. So what, what, what do these institutions do? So, I mean, if you have a um, society, then the society can um, develop institutions that are good for economic development, like for example, um, institutions that allow to set up a firm or to set up a trading business in a city or to uh, perform farming activities in a reasonable way, or you can have institutions that basically take away a lot of the fruits of the work and that um, are not, encouraging something or somebody to really invest and to work hard so all right a big difference yes professor Baden, age eping why is this important in many of your studies you often t discuss age eping yeah so age heaping is one strategy to measure the numeracy of the whole population I mean, there are some obstacles to that, but uh, we can discuss that. Basically, the idea is that if you have records like censuses or court records, then people are often asked, what is your age? And then people sometimes stop and think, saying, well, I'm around 40. I do not know exactly. Um, so that often means they are not exactly 40, but they might be 39 or 41. They are just um, saying that because it's roughly correct. And we have observed that this rounding behavior correlates very strongly with um, being able to process numerical skills. So we are using that as a proxy indicator because it often reflects quite well how basic numerate people are or not. Yes, and you have done studies on the topic for the Middle East, Europe, and Africa. And in, and in these studies, you often examine the role of bureaucracies. Shed some light on bureaucracies. Why are they important? Well, I mean, bureaucracies are important for a number of reasons. Uh, I mean, if you want to collect taxes, for example, then you need some bureaucracies because you don't have to know who has already paid the tax and you have to make an estimate about how much people can pay for a tax. 
So bureaucracies are important for uh, 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 government life, for spending on infrastructure, for example, on railways and so on, later on streets and canals in the earlier periods. Um, I mean, in this particular context of the age shipping procedure, bureaucracies are also important because they collect information. At the same time, there is a bit of a risk that sometimes the bureaucrats are more um, careful in collecting very exact information. In other times, that's less uh, the case. So we have to take that into account also when we use this age shipping based numeracy method. All right. Professor Baden, around two years ago, in 2019, you and Thomas Keywood produced a paper titled Elite Violence and Elite Numeracy in Europe from 500 to 1900 CE roots of the divergence and this paper is significant professor because unlike most papers in the literature you, you you made an attempt to explain why the great divergence did not occur in eastern europe why why are, why are countries in non-western europe so different yeah so basically the great divergence you have already explained um, in many of the previous videos this strong difference between western europe on the one hand and asia in particular on the other hand but there was also this divergence movement within europe i think you're speaking about that now where we observe that eastern europe um, was not growing as quickly as Western Europe, especially during the early modern period, this 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, and then also the industrial area, the 19th century, and then in the 20th century, there was some convergence again. So it is very important for Europeans and for everybody to know why these diverging moments occurred. And uh, Tom and I studied this using um, elite violence and elite numeracy data based on European rulers. So we were curious, um, we have these long lists of rulers from all corners of Europe. And first of all, we were curious how many of them were actually murdered. So that was the motivations to gain a variable that we think could be very interesting to explain this divergence pattern, because if we um, would have more violence, then it might be more difficult to develop institutions that build on trust normally. It would also result in a whole culture of revenge where people would um, see your family members are killed, then you probably would want to take revenge and kill other people. So that was one of the ideas why we studied that. And our idea was to look at the share of rulers of a certain level um, who were killed. Um, and we observed that between West and East Europe, there was basically no difference up to the year 1000 roughly. And then we see a divergence um, that preceded this divergence of income that is often documented. So we um, see quite a stronger um, um, divergence of violence first. And then we also observe a divergence of elite numeracy to measure with another proxy indicator, namely the share of um rulers for whom at least a birth year is recorded so often long lists of rulers existed with the years when they were ruling and whether they were leading major wars that's also often included but only in some of these um documents we see that ruler birth years were included for Charlemagne, for example, there was no birth year known. Uh, and for many other medieval rulers, there was also no birth year known. So we calculated the percentage of this 
and that allowed us to explore the divergence between West and East Europe. Professor, in Eastern Europe, did institutions enable violence at the expense of economic growth? You hinted at this in your article, Elite Violence and Elite Numeracy in Europe from 500 to 1900 CE, a co-evolution. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, the institutions matter a lot, especially uh, for Eastern Europe. We know that um, there was a, a reintroduction of um, uh, servitude in the 16th and 17th century, which was uh, certainly one of the major events and that was a big problem for eastern europe and it's in its development if you are somebody who is oppressed from serfdom then uh, you do not have much incentives to invest into the education of your children so that is certainly something some institutional factor that we need to take into account this famous second serfdom Interestingly, in our regressions, we don't arrive at a very strong effect of this second serfdom on the elites now. Um, it probably had a stronger impact on the overall population, whereas the elites um, were not as affected by this. Then, of course, there are many other institutional factors like the Western European um, institutions for mergence, which mattered, and uh, yeah, a lot of other institutional settings. And, and this is how you com conclude the conclusion. Eastern societies created institutions primarily aimed at defense rather than economic development, even over the following centuries when the threat had long disappeared. Why were these institutions not altered since the threat was no longer in existence? Yeah. So, I mean, institutions, of course, always have a relatively strong persistence once they are created. Uh, people got get used to them and it's not so easy to change them. Um, however, I would say that a certain degree of change was there as the elite violence in the European regions declined over time. I mean, especially after the late medieval period, we see a strong decline both of elite violence and of general violence. And this increased the trust. And even if some institutions were still in place, they um, were acting in a different way. They were uh, could be based on more trust and therefore they were also more efficient. Professor Bayen. You have also produced some rather fascinating pieces on Poland, and I am interested in Poland, and I'm sure that my listeners are also interested in Poland. Could you shed some light on Poland's economic history, and I'm specifically referring to serfdom, the Great Divergence, and as expected, why Poland is not as rich as other as as countries in Western Europe? Yeah, sure. I mean, Poland is a very interesting country and it reveals a lot about European development in general. Um, it is one of the central European countries, of course, and we have very important studies um, by earlier scholars like, for example, Jan Leuten van Santen or Robert Allen um, or Mikolai um who have studied the development of poland and who actually observed that interestingly in the early period in the 16th century um, poland had a relatively high um, real wage for important parts of the population um, so given that it was a grain exporting region uh, grain was especially uh, unpro unprocessed grain was relatively cheap, so uh, people could afford a relatively good diet. Um, and only if you introduce more and more of the processed goods, then um, it becomes a bit more 
um, balanced in comparison to England, for example, which has the reputation of being one of the growth motors of Western European development. Um, so Poland is interesting because it had this early high level and then it was falling back over time, also in the work of, for example, Mikolai Malinowski, we see that uh, there were strong institutional problems. Uh, it was very difficult to reach a consensus between the different nobility fractions and Poland was falling back in relative terms. Um, and then looking at our numeracy data, we observe that well, first Poland was quite um, good situation in the European comparison and the other regions were increasing faster in terms of numeracy. Yes, and as expected, I'm going to share your paper with the audience, a golden age before serfdom, the human capital of central, eastern and eastern, the human, the human capital of central, eastern and eastern Europe in the 17th to 19th centuries. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that was one study where we looked at a lot of the um, Central European, East Central and Eastern European countries, and we quantified their numeracy level over time. Um, and we see uh, yeah, a, strong, a strongly different development in these different regions. For example, uh, Poland was doing uh, quite well with a basic numeracy of around 60% in the 17th century. Um, that was roughly at the same level as Southern Europe at that time, uh, whereas later on Southern Europe was, for example, growing faster, not to speak of Northwest, Northwestern Europe. So there was some divergence even during the 18th century going on between Poland, and Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, and Southern Europe, um, which is quite remarkable. Poland, and as you explain, this finding might support the hypothesis that the second serfdom process, which gained momentum during the 17th century, was one of the core reasons why human capital accumulation was delayed in Eastern Europe. Serfdom, why didn't it recede in Eastern Europe? Well, I mean, Eastern Europe um, was initially very sparsely populated in the medieval period. So uh, initially the local um, dukes and lords had to attract migrants to come to Eastern Europe. So they gave them a relatively good legal situation, which allowed a decent standard of living. But then as population grew, as you said, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, um, this kind of attractiveness um, uh, requirement was not given to the same extent anymore. I mean, in some regions still, um, but other regions were growing in population. So the strategy of the uh, nobility who wanted to increase their own um, living standards and their luxury production and so on was to uh, extract more resources from their peasants and from the day laborers. So uh, this second serfdom, which was um, a very tough uh, institutional fr framework for Eastern Europeans, was uh, reintroduced and uh, becoming quite tough in comparison to uh, other European countries. All right, then. But Professor Baden, according to the state capacity literature, wars should create bureaucracies and in the long term unleash a period of growth. But as you note, the major wars in the region also had devastating effects on effects on numeracy levels. War did not lead to state capacity in Poland. Well, I mean, um, every country has its own history and we are trying to find interesting common factors, um, but still, of course, there's a lot of um, 
different things going on. I mean, we have uh, Poland, of course, has two neighbors, um, Germany and Russia, who are sometimes a bit uh, challenging from the Polish perspective. We know that, and there were, of course, many um, crimes permitted in history. Um, so that is, of course, one of the issues. Um, but then, of course, there's also this economic development that sometimes um, allows a more positive institutional development, more state capability. In the Polish case, we had um, a very large state in the um, 17th century, as it was um, uh, jointly reigned with Lithuania and including parts of Ukraine and so on. Um, so this um, large Polish state was a bit challenging given the communication technology of the time. Um, in Poland, basically, we see this development of um, a relatively strong position of mobility, which was not always benefiting the um, economy and the poorer people. I mean, the, Poland was also exporting, as we know from Kula's work, a lot of their high quality nutrition to Western Europe, to the Netherlands, for example. Um, so it is also in one of the challenges that Poland um, had sometimes nutritional problems as they were exporting a lot of their food production and importing instead a lot of luxury products from western europe yeah maybe professor Baden, Baden, at some point we should study when wars are optimal for growth and state capacity yeah i think this would be an interesting line of research because there's also a new paper saying that there isn't a relationship between wars and state capacity in africa yeah so maybe we should look for the optimal level yeah, the optimal level is difficult. I mean, that of course depends on many technological factors, communication technologies, on um, health, uh, whether people can talk with each other or they might be, as we are now in the pandemic, afraid to communicate with each other. So there are many different things, but I agree it would be very, very nice to have this um, as a research agenda. Definitely. Yes. And Professor Baden, do we have data on pre-industrial wages in Poland? Pre-industrial wages, yes. Mikolai Malinowski was the last person who worked on wages. I mean, he, um, of course, had also the challenge that um, there are different kinds of workers. I mean, we have the urban day laborers and more skilled artisans. We have rural day laborers, and then we have the uh, peasants. And normally we know the least about the peasants. So um, what they really earn because part of the income was subsistence income, what they produce, they were consuming. Um, and that's always a bit challenging to uh, estimate wages, but um, the um, more skilled uh, uh, and the urban laborers in the beginning had a relatively decent real wage, uh, especially a real wage in which the consumption goods are mostly unprocessed food items. If you add one more textiles or bread, um, which is already processed um, grain, of course, uh, then you have effects like, well, the bakeries had their gills and they were selling bread at a certain price and um, that was also regulated by urban gills. And this that actually led Bob Elm, Robert Elm to estimate the real wage in Poland a bit more pessimistic than England. Yes. So, Malinowski, in one of his papers, Income and its Distribution in Pre-Industrial Poland, submits the following conclusion. Our results indicate that Polish per capita GDP 
was below that of Western Europe as early as the 15th century. And it gets interesting, this gap persisted despite moderate, gro despite moderate growth of the Polish economy in the 16th century. In the 17th century, Poland impoverished and became even poorer than Asian economies for which similar estimates are available. Poland recovered slightly in the 18th century, but continued to lag behind Western Europe. What's revealing about this result results is that the great divergence actually started quite early i'm really interested in, in in the data pushing the great divergence back in time but based on what i've been reading the great divergence started before the 17th century and some also contend that there was a great divergence in management practices yeah well i mean we are of course, we have all sorts of data problems that um, is also important. And um, GDP, the total, is of course not equaling the real wage, um, typically earned by workers, typically both skilled and unskilled workers. Um, so a large component of the GDP in early modern Europe is, of course, also what um the income of merchants and owners of the middle and richer part of society and um this component of gdp um also made poland a bit even falling back earlier compared to the um wage income and the real wage income all right it's true that the divergence was quite early and we actually trace it back to the year 1000 because we observe that after the year 1000 um, central eastern and eastern europe and southeastern europe fell back in terms of numerous elite numeracy so there was actually no growth after the year after the 7th century uh, up to the 15th century when it also started to increase whereas in northwestern europe and in also in southwestern europe we see a strong increase in elite between the year 1000 and the year 1500 okay okay then but before we talk about your paper on africa could you list the paper in which you make these conclusions for my listeners oh yeah that was the paper um with tom keywood um about the um elite numeracy and elite violence in europe and uh, professor baden in your surveys do you notice a trend explaining why elite violence will will decline mm -hmm. yes um so i mean that's one of the fascinating topics as well of um, world history and uh, in this case european history that we see a relatively continuous decline in the, the 15th century um, before that it was not so clear in some um, countries it begin began to decline in other countries it did not but as actually as the high middle ages the 14th and 15th century was a kind of um increase temporary increase in regicide due to the intolerance of that time and the many conflicts also the organization played a role um, but then after the 15th century we see a continuous decline of killing of rulers and also of killing in the overall population that was relatively synchronous in most of the european countries and the reasons um behind this decline is that we see um first of all more um consistent state development the state managed to convince the society that it was not a good idea to kill each other and to um develop this or continuously 
um, keep up this culture of revenge, um, which led to a strong killing both within the elites and all right in the elites and the overall population okay, all right and finally we're going to talk about your paper so professor baden i was online reading the african economic history network and i wasn't searching for you i was just reading it because i like the blog and then i saw your paper and i was like yes finally more data on africa because i'm always in the mood to research africa since we know so much about pre-colonial africa and i think that well this paper obviously is a groundbreaking paper the first of its kind and the first paper to truly assess elite violence and numeracy in africa then again by you all right but, you. <laughs> yes but before before i ask the pertinent questions just briefly tell us about the mutapa empire the people yeah. Then what happened is one of the fascinating cases that really arose very much my interest and I plan to work more on it in the future. I mean, we have um, these centers of early development in East Africa, Abyssinia, um, part of uh, Zambia, and then also and Madagascar, and then the uh, Mutapa Empire, which was situated in today's Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Zambia as well. Um, and the Portuguese, which were sailing around Africa, were um, putting it on their map, uh, showing empires covering a vast amount of the southern part of southern and eastern part of Africa. Um, so the Mutapa Empire was already quite developed in the 15th century before the Portuguese really showed up. Uh, in the 16th century, it reached its highest level of development. And we also observe a relatively high elite numeracy, the share of known birth years of rulers in the Mutapa Empire was very high in the 16th century. And the level of violence was relatively low. Then during the 17th century, a certain internal conflict and also a strong conflict with its Western and Southern neighbors um, led to a certain decline. And then in the 18th century, um, it was reduced to a very modest, um, small principality. But Mutapa is really fascinating because it had this institutional structure in the West in the 16th century with different layers of government with the king having a council. Um, I mean, it was an absolute monarch, but he still listened to his council called the king's wives, um, although in reality, most of his council was men, the senior wife of the in that. And we see a very strong um, economic development, also a strong power situation. They were able to keep the Portuguese off when there was a conflict after the Jesuit had baptized uh, Mutapa ruler. There were uh, killings of the Jesuit uh, missionary and um, the Portuguese took that as a justification to invade, but they were able to push them out again. So there was also some strength in this um, Southeast Africa. Um, and the similar empires include Bakongo, Imperial Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, Sawa, and again you cited Mutapa, and I will read. Tortana, Tortana 2001 describe the literate rulers of Bakongo who themselves documented events from approximately 1500 along with their capitals in today's Angola. During the early 16th century, all relevant documents were written exclusively by the elites of Bakongo. For example, let letters by the famous ruler who was known under his adopted Portuguese name of Alfonso I. The early literacy of these African rulers and, and their surrounding elites was well documented in early 16th century sources. 
during the early 17th century, Bakong Bakongo teachers from Congo trans translated the Portuguese catechism of Marcos George. This translation was then published in 1624. It is clear that elite numeracy and the adoption of writing systems and numerical tools went hand in hand. This kingdom was able to adopt it while others were not. Yeah. yeah. So the Makongo, um, Makongo was really a remarkable uh, kingdom. I fully, um, I think that is one of the uh, very interesting cases in African history. But Ethiopia is also important because in the paper you know that compared to countries in Eastern Europe, the Ethiopians had the edge in numerical skills. Yeah, so we were curious whether um, the most developed parts um, of Africa at that time, namely the um, Abyssinian Empire, um, was how did that compare to the slightly less um, numerate, elite numerate regions of Europe? And we in fact observed that um, after the 14th, 15th century, when Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine entered this phase of weakness during the second serfdom, which also had indirect impact on the elites, um, we actually observed that the elite numeracy, the, again measured as the share of known rulers, the ruler birth years, um, compared very positively to um, this part of Europe. So during the 16th and 17th century, this African was ahead of this European region. And only thereafter, um, when Imperial Abyssinia ended a weakness phase due to uh, internal conflict and also uh, conflicts with its suffer southern neighbors, um, we observed that Abyssinia fell back relative to um, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Exactly. Professor Baden, we're wrapping up, and this issue was never discussed in your paper. It's a tangential issue, but I am interested in it. Bureaucracies and development. There is a new paper on bureaucracy and development by a leading economist. Ethiopia is an Asian state. It had a bureaucracy. But I am wondering what was the extent to which technical knowledge was disseminated in the bureaucracy so you didn't study the issue but i think that it's an issue that you ought to study mm, yes no definitely bureaucracies yeah. are very interesting and um, i mean sometimes they have a dampening effect on technology i mean we all know that bureaucracies can also uh, be very conservative and preventing uh, new innovations that is the other side of bureaucracies, but then also they are often a proxy for the capability of the state to collect information and maybe also to encourage um, people who are um, building new firms, new ways of production. That's certainly something that um, also matters. In the Ethiopian or Abyssinian case, we have some rulers who were very adverse to development, namely before we start in the 12th century, there were rulers who were more proud on their military success over neighboring Islamic states and who were proud on arresting Egyptian merchants, um, creating um, states um, institutional situation which was not conducive to growth. And then we have these rulers like Jacob I, who was somebody who uh, founded libraries, schools, who was um, very positive to the technology of printing, for example, and uh, was printing uh, religious books, both in their own language and script, and also in Arabic, in order to advertise this to neighboring Arabic societies. 
And maybe there is a distinction between a technical bureaucracy and a non-technical bureaucracy. Yeah. I think that this is a crucial issue. Mm -hmm. Based on my reading of Ethiopia's history so far, there might be a possibility that the, the bureaucracy in pre-colonial Ethiopia was non-technical. Many of the leading scholars in Ethiopia were actually religious individuals. Yeah, no, I mean, sure, we have uh, religion which plays a strong role also in Europe. Uh, I mean, I looked with Jan Leuten van Sanden at all these book titles, and I mean, most of them were religious texts, but people were interested in that because they um, organized their societies and exchanged a lot of ideas about how um, religion could be used to organize societies. That was a major issue for Euro Europeans. I guess it was also a major issue for Abyssinians or Ethiopians, as we would say nowadays. All right. So, Professor Baden, I really enjoy your presentation. As expected, you did a great job, but unfortunately, I have to wrap up. So, bye and continue to produce brilliant essays. Thank you very much for your um, very well informed interview. I'm impressed by how well you informed yourself before speaking, and I think it's a great format that you're doing here. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye bye.